about being good on the one hand and being ethical on another hand. What does it mean to say a lawyer is good? What are some of the things that come to our mind when we say a lawyer is good? What makes a lawyer ethical? By good lawyer, I mean a professionally competent and effective lawyer. Two things. You are competent. You are effective. There are many people who are competent but completely ineffective. And there are some people who are effective but completely incompetent. Now, distinguished students, balancing those two are what make you. We mean a moral person. A person who has a praiseworthy character. People praise you when they call your name. They say, ah, that is a good man. They will recommend you behind your back. They will say great things about you behind your back. That is what builds the character and it does not come from you being a shady lawyer, a sharp lawyer, a lawyer who believes in cutting corners, a lawyer who believes in money and what is money and nothing else matters. Legal opinion seldom discuss the lawyer as a moral agent. Even when reviewing specific conduct found to violate professional ethical norms, we often base our assessment on merely what the lawyer did wrong or right vis-a-vis -vis the plaintiff and the defendant or more generally the client. That is what we base on what a good lawyer is. But we need a basis for an assessment of the whole person that can provide insight into personality and character of the individual lawyer beyond a particular case. So it's not about what the lawyer did today with his client and things like that. It's about who the person the lawyer is holistic as a person. I will attempt to describe a good lawyer to you as one who has a vast understanding of the law. So the first quality of a good lawyer is you must have a vast understanding of the law. And we have to find it in the books. A good lawyer will look at you and tell you, go to volume 5 of Hospital's Laws of England, you'll find it there. He will tell his client, I cannot give you the answer today, but I will go and look into Glasgow's law and come back to you on this. So a good lawyer does not have to memorize the laws. A good lawyer does not have to know all the laws. In fact, a good lawyer can be totally ignorant in several areas of the law. It's a question of whether he or she is capable of finding the material to help him. And Lord, my Lord, he just is, you know, these cases come before them all the time. Sometimes they are not even thought about it. But what makes them good is research. So the first thing, the lawyer who has the vast understanding of the law and those who have find it in the book. A good lawyer is also a good listener. You can't be a good lawyer and you speak more than your client. The man is starting to explain, you already tell him solutions. You should have the grace to sit there and watch this man or woman see what they have to say. A good lawyer has a good communication skill. And a good communication skill does not mean you are talkative. But you are capable of communicating.
communicating your message. There are some lawyers who are quiet by nature. They don't talk much, they have few words. What is important is the effective communication skill. If you are also so quiet and you cannot even explain to your client simple things, you are in the wrong position. You have to be capable of communicating effectively. And effective communication can even be by sign language like this. If it passes on the message, you are effective. If the message can understand what you're saying, you are effective. If you have the need of the guard, you can stand, you can sit and explain. That's fine for you. As long as you are effective. Effectiveness is the person understanding what you want to say, and you say it sometimes with less word, but the person understands you. Don't confuse them this A good lawyer exudes a people character. I have seen a lot of arrogant lawyers. They speak to their clients in ways I have started there and like, what? You speak to your client that way. You speak to people that way. You meet people, you don't smile at them. You don't greet them, you don't talk to them. You are not a people person, you don't know how to manage people. A really good lawyer knows how to manage people. How to speak to them, how to make them laugh, how to communicate with them, how to get money from them without them feeling pain. <laughs> That's a good lawyer. Lastly, and most importantly, a good lawyer has creativity. Today there is a lot of talk of innovation also. A lot of CEOs. I see a lot of CEOs in this room. All of you, I know a lot of them. The great CEOs is the very team here too. <laughs> but what really makes a good lawyer is the creativity. Thinking on your feet. How do I maximize the interest of my client today in this circumstance? I don't know always mean win. It can be perfectly losing. But losing in a way that the client benefits. So, a good lawyer is creative. You look at the situation, this is a totally bad situation, but you come up with a rabbit and solution for your client. And you explain to them, you see this case, Madam, if you go to court, you are going to lose. But you know what we are going to do? We are going to write a letter to that client and up ahead. So when you lose, you lose 100 million. But we can up ahead something and you only have to pay 50 million. That's great. That is created. A good lawyer is innovative. Just like all the CEOs are, a good lawyer produces for their client. Is only for 
concerned about this client. And most times, in fact, for several years, the dominant teaching of lawyering was exactly that. I was taught that in this law school. By then, we had Master Caesar of Blessed Elizabeth, who was our ethic lecturer. The client's first duty is to who? The lawyer's first duty is to your client. So that is a lawyer advocate viewpoint. And there are many people who believe in it. Nothing else should matter to you. You should only care about your client and producing results for your client. As long as you, think you do it within the law, you should not do something illegal. You are perfectly right as a lawyer. More recently, however, legal ethics scholars have begun to challenge the hegemony of this model. I argue that ethical lawyering involves not just the suspension of moral judgment, but the exercise of it. So ethical lawyering is not just a suspension of moral judgment. There are times when lawyers just sit down, they say, the man explains, and he says, sir, what do you want me to do when I go to court? And the lawyer asks him back, what do you want to go and do? It's basically saying, it does not matter. How much are you willing to pay? Let's go and do it. They say the lawyer has the red color is green. Do you know that? The lawyer's favorite color is green. There is no black and white. And you know the problem with green? Do you know the problem with green? What is the biggest problem with green? There are different shades of green. <laughs> Not so? Yes. There is a light green and there is a charcoal green. Between the light gray and the charcoal gray, my brothers and sisters, there's a lot. Sometimes we wonder, even as lawyers, we have no one's all the time. What kind of gray should you wear to court? And some people say, oh no, the gray should not be empathic. How can gray be empathic? <laughs> but this tells you why gray is the lawyer's favorite color. Because the gray gets thicker depending on how much the client is ready to pay. <laughs> and it can also get lighter how much the client is willing to pay. So, this is now being challenged. The alternative contextual view says lawyers can make personal moral responsibility for consequences of their professional acts. So that challenge that says that the lawyer should not care as long as it's within the law and protects the interest of the client. Some have come and said, we have to move away from that. It says, it is not the suspension of moral judgment. There are lawyers who will who tell you, me, I don't judge my client. So he's suspending moral judgment. But they are now saying, actually, it is the exercise of it. For you to look at your client and tell your client, I have looked at these facts you explained to me, you want me to represent you, this is more than. I have gone and defend you on other things, technicalities, a lot of other things. The year and the one year and the day rule. I can say the one year and the day rule has gone, but I'm not going to say you don't give it. Do we understand ourselves? So, lawyers have had this argument in between. The one who says, let us be the ostrich and bury our head in the sand. Do you know the ostrich? Yes. Do you know how the ostrich lives? Yes. Just bury his head in the sand. No matter how many typhoon comes, it remains there. And anything that happens passes. But there are some lawyers who are now saying that we have to move around this. So in support of the lawyer advocate model, I will give you the interesting case of Lord Henry Boram in 1820. Lord Henry Boram was a lord in Britain, and the king was married to Queen Caroline, who committed adultery. She was caught sleeping with one of the courtiers. So, the king wanted to divorce Queen Caroline on this ground. But Caroline had a secret for the king. Her secret was that the king, before he 
becoming king secretly marrying a Roman Catholic lady. <laughs> and at that time, marrying a Roman Catholic lady may he not be eligible to become king of England. So Caroline gave this message to the lawyer, Lord Brown. And then, Lord Brown said, Oh God, thank you very much. Now I have something to hold this king. And he went and told the king, you either negotiate quietly with my client and move away, or we are going to tell everybody that you have married the Catholic. And then the entire realm was shaken by this. Because imagine removing the king, the consequences of society, the problems, having to have a new succession battle and everything, and it all got wrong. But you cannot do this, you will descend the realm into chaos. There will be war. There are princes in France, Germany, who have a claim to the British throne who will come and claim it. And listen carefully to what Abraham told them in the House of Lords. An advocate in the discharge of his duty knows but one person in war. And that person is his client. To save that client by all means and experience and at all hazards and cost to other persons and among them to himself is his first and only duty. And in performing this duty, he must not regard the alarm, the torments, the destruction which he may bring upon others. Separating the duty of a patriot from that of an advocate, he must go on reckless of consequences, though it would be his unhappy fate to involve his country in confusion. Did you follow me? That must have been one goal you have been also. <laughs> He's basically saying, I don't give a damn. <laughs> you people deal with having to fight succession, they keep me. I only have one client, Caroline. Caroline cannot be divorced for adultery. Or better still, give her, give her some of the biggest castles on her, castles on her, as long as she will pay me my own share. I am fine. <laughs> what happens to England? The chaos. The confusion, plunging the country into the war, that is your business. <laughs> that is a classical example of an advocate lawyer. And trust me, in my 15 years of practice, I have met many of them. I see the Lord Jesus with my He deals with them every day. <laughs> he will be saying, this temptation, we cannot do it now. They say, oh my God, if the Lord says we should throw these people out, throw them out. I don't care if they don't have somewhere to sleep. They can go and find out what they need. My client has had this judgment for one year. We must escape. While notions of professionalism and constraints of personal character may result in a more benign understanding of the lawyer advocate, it should be clear that the lawyer advocate does not identify with the pursuit of the common good. Rather, the lawyer advocate knows and pursues only the interest of one person in the world. And that person is... Now, I am giving you two stories. And I'm now jumping to the story as presented by a man called Anthony Coleman, who was the dean of the Yale Law School. He's one of those who said, this way we are doing things as lawyers is not right. We can't say we don't care about the common good. We plunge the world into chaos. We bring destruction. Do you know in 2008 the financial market crashed? Many believe that it's lawyers who caused it. It was lawyers who caused it. By giving reckless advice. By going after the money. 
by caring only about their, their own bank and not caring what happens in other banks. And they plunge the world into the chaos from which we have not ever recovered. So a valuable source of beginning our examination of the role of lawyers in society is the writings of Anthony Coleman, the former dean of Yale Law School, who wrote the monograph, The Lost Lawyer, in 1993. In this book, Coleman wrote about the embodiment of professional excellence for lawyers in the early republic as an idealization, as an idealized thing of capture in the concept of the lawyer statesman. So he now created a card I call the lawyer statesman. While these lawyers were certainly engaged in the mundane business of earning a living in their law offices with the likelihood of engaging in grand exercise of technology, these attorneys engaged in practice with this model of the lawyer statesman in mind. The lawyer statesman was a source of inspiration as the attorney engaged in advising and representing individuals who were viewed as having all the limitations and faults of human beings. So the first thing about the lawyer statesman is to accept that my clients can be wrong. My clients can be stupid. My clients can be vile human beings. So you approach it with that yogish detachment and you view your client from the point of view of somebody on the outside. According to Cronman, the paradigm of the lawyer statesman embodied an ideal of character. In this view, the lawyer aimed not only to be an accomplished technician, but at the same time sought to be a distinctive and praiseworthy type of person. Let me repeat that again. In this view, the lawyer aimed not only to be an accomplished technician. You all are learning to be technicians, right? You don't think that the only man, the man who repairs the radio is a technician. You are all technicians. But this man is saying, he sought to be a distinctive and praiseworthy type of person. A person of practical wisdom. A person of practical wisdom. In addition, the lawyer statesman was to be a devoted citizen who cared about the public good and sought to secure it in his work. When the lawyer statesman acted as an advocate of private interest or as a counselor in matters of the state, he provided advice and guided to help his clients deliberate and come to an informed understanding of the client's ambitions, interests, and goals. And come to an informed understanding of the client's own ambitions, interests, and goals. But as significant, the lawyer statement sought to guide the client's decision in the direction of the common good. Yes, no problem. Yes. Um. Sorry to interrupt you. Hello, sir. the Chief Justice of the Republic of Sierra Leone and the Chairman of the Council of Legal Education. It is a pleasure on behalf of the staff of the Sierra Leone Law School to present you with the cap of the Sierra Leone Law School and a t-shirt, very unique color, different from what we are wearing. And that is the only person in this 
work. Every other person can go and put the money free. As long as we decide that we can. But I was now bringing you from man who came to say we cannot continue to do this. The loyal test man is distinguished by his qualities of character so that he is defined by who he is as much as what he knows and by what he does. When I use he, it means she as well. The loyal test man possesses of great practical wisdom and exceptional persuasive power. He is devoted to the public good but keenly aware of the limitations of human beings and their political arrangements. Coleman concludes that the ideal of the loyal statesman
that we take for granted. You know, when I sit in my office as a prophet commissioner, a lot of lawyers come. And as we speak, I feel that some of the things that come across. So for those of you who go to my office, you see that the chairs are very far away from my table. <laughs> because I believe in nonverbal communication. I observe more what happens around the person than what the person sees. And uh, I see clearly who is a statesman lawyer who comes to my office. There are some people who come, some lawyers come to my office and say, Ben, you see this man I am representing? He's a criminal. <laughs> So, when I have come to you, let him learn his lesson. When do I come back to ask you for it? <laughs> but some will come and the first thing they start reading to me is the Constitution. Oh, man, is that all right? The man has not even asked me what this man has done that he has been arrested. What wrong he has done to society. The bridge that he was supposed to build, that he has not built. Five years ago, the money that was sent to the account which he withdrew, there is no evidence of the money being used for anything else, and God knows what it was used for. But when this man comes, the first thing he's asking for is what section 23 of the Constitution says. <laughs> so I usually look at them and I just buy. But you will see this in practice. I'm sure you saw the Chief Justice Bible. He sees this a lot. The statesman lawyer is practical. He understands how the real world works. He sees the interests of his clients. But he knows how to approach. He knows. Now, as lawyers, we have a duty, and that duty is divided into many other duties. Yes, there is a duty to your client, but there is your duty to your profession, first of all. There is a duty to your profession. You do not bring your profession into this duty. So if what you have to do for your client will bring the legal profession into this duty, to advise That is what is straight. You have a duty to your country. Sierra Leone. The only way you can thrive as lawyers, all of you, if Sierra Leone is peaceful. If the economy is working, If there is law and order, what we call rule of law, and society itself is fair and just. And you'll be surprised how much each of you will have to contribute to that by doing the things you see in your chamber when no one is there. Most importantly, students, you will have a responsibility as a good boy. Your reputation is everything to you. If you think that your reputation does not matter, I used to have, I remember when we were coming up, I used to have friends who would say, I don't care what anybody says. I do what I do. And there was one particular person who I remember. She's a lawyer. I remember telling her that what other people say about you is everything. And the way you are approaching life is wrong. Several years down the line, I met that same lawyer again. 
By then, we all had no job. At that time, we were very good. But now we are. And she told me, you know, Francis, we argued over this several times at that time. But I have now come to accept you. That the reputation of you, how your peers view you, Class, all of you are competing with yourselves. Even for the air we breathe right now, we are competing for <laughs> The air, the, the oxygen is Some people are breathing in one carbon dioxide and other. <laughs> Do you know why? <laughs> Probably their noses are bigger. <laughs> but if it's suddenly limited, what for that? Many are called. Many are called. That statement in the Bible is more true of the legal profession. And probably it is even for going. Because God is gracious. He forgives. His grace allows not so man and pastor. Not so. <laughs> but in the human world, we are unforgiving. We can protect. Many are called, but few are chosen. When I gave the same lecture two years ago, she was in that class. The class was small. Not then. I remember the lecture I gave was then was banal before the gate came out. It's on YouTube, you can see it there. Today I am here, and the class is three times. Most likely, all of you are going to be called to the conference. And I'm happy for that. As many people need to have opportunities to become lawyers as possible. We cannot be closing the gates to access to opportunities. And that is what our lecture was about, which I gave three years ago, but now before the gatekeepers. And I know that there are gatekeepers who are there to make it impossible for you. Some of them lecture. <laughs> but Mr. Bangura has not had this. They don't want you to become a They will do everything to frustrate you. But with somebody like Dr. Bangura, a friend of mine who has known for several years, in fact, I advise him to leave Australia and come back to Singapore. <laughs> <laughs>
Never forget this. If even it is your girlfriend or your boyfriend, that girlfriend or boyfriend will never respect you. So, I remember when I was at the law school and who was of these things of examination and practice, I thought, I will flee. I will practice. I remember one time we were taking civil procedure. And I went, I left Abadin and went all the way to Eastern. Then it was at my friend Koto Kamara, who is now the registrar in the Supreme Court. It was at Koto Kamara's house where we went to discuss the procedure. And I was there and I started hearing rumors of leakage in the procedure. I immediately left. Because as I have told you, the friend who sees you again and practice will never respect you for the rest of this <laughs> When it comes to recommending people for good things, you recommend everybody else except you. And you are asking yourself, we sleep together, we eat together. Why did this man the opportunity came to appoint somebody a judge? And he went and appointed a stranger and he left me out. Because he remembers when you were in law school, you are cheating. You are not cheating. <laughs> I am inviting all of you to start practicing to be a statesman. Now, the journey starts here. All of you are competing with yourselves. When you finish here, when you go to law school, the star of your will be the first person to call his case. Before all of you here. I have benefited from it. And I know how good it feels. When people of your class are sitting with you at the bar, and other senior lawyers finish calling their case, and you look at them and tell them, please do not start off. I have to present my case before you. But, with all honesty, I am happy for all of you for making it to the law school. And I wish you well. Salute so people will be better than there too. Anytime where you go, you go come right back, oh, oh, oh.